Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Welcome everyone. to today's update on COVID-19 in Alberta. With us today is the Minister of Health, Tyler Shandro, Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation, Doug Schweitzer, and Dr. Dina Hinshaw. Minister Shandro will open us off today. Thanks, Tom, and good afternoon, everyone. First, uh, let me start off by saying Alberta's case numbers and hospitalizations remain high and they pose a threat to our healthcare system capacity, and they continue to. Now, when we introduced new mandatory health measures in December, we did so uh, that uh, with a goal to limiting, limiting as much in-person interaction as possible, and the point was to minimize exposure to the virus. Today, we can't entirely ease up on this goal, but uh, we can make small adjustments to provide Albertans with some limited activities. First, we know that many of you put outdoor uh, get-togethers with your family and friends during the past holiday season on hold in order to comply with the restrictions at that time. Now, for everyone listening, we appreciate your efforts. That's why I'm pleased to announce that today we are, or we are today announcing that we are loosening the restrictions around outdoor social gatherings Starting January 18th, which is next Monday, outdoor social gatherings consisting of up to 10 people. Is there a technical difficulty? Is that right? Okay. That uh, as of next Monday, January 18th, outdoor social gatherings consisting of up to 10 people will be allowed. We have to encourage everyone to still continue following the health guidelines during outdoor social gatherings. And what does that mean? It's wearing masks, it's keeping at least two meters apart, and it's refraining from using any indoor facilities while gathering with other folks. Indoor social gatherings, let me be clear, are still not allowed. Also starting January 18th, personal and wellness services may reopen, but by appointment only. Now these services include businesses like hair salons, barber shops, aesthetics, manicure and pedicure businesses, reflexology, piercing and tattoo shops, and other uh, of our many different personal wellness, personal and wellness services uh, businesses throughout the province. Appointments should be limited to one-on-one services and businesses and clients are expected to keep following the public health guidelines. We are also easing restrictions on how many people can attend funeral services we're raising the limit to 20 people, but still funeral receptions are still prohibited. Now, we made these decisions very carefully and these measures were based, um, and uh, these measures were eased based on the expertise and the advice of our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hinshaw. We wanna stop as a province going back and forth with tightening and then loosening the rules. I, uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, Albertans are tired of going back and forth themselves. We also need to take into consideration the fact that there are two variants of the, uh, the COVID uh, virus, the B117 uh, variant, which was first identified in the United Kingdom, as well as the 507Y V2 variant that was first identified in South Africa. And these variants, well, they require us to continue to take a cautious and pragmatic approach. We've seen escalating case counts in other countries because of the infectiousness of these variants, and we must not move too quickly to open up restrictions. At this point, I I want to stress to everyone that while we are actively looking at what restrictions we are able to ease in the weeks ahead in order to make any further changes, We need everyone's cooperation to stay within the rules. That means mandatory masking in all public indoor spaces and working from home if it's possible. Now, don't bend the rules to fit you. They're not designed to be flexible. By now, we have all seen how far a single case can go to spread to others. And that one time that you ignore the rules might ripple through the rest of your community and with serious consequences. As of right now, we can't say when measures will be eased next, but we are monitoring the situation closely and we are meeting regularly with Dr. Hinshaw. If we continue to see case rates 
and hospitalizations and our ICU admissions continue to slow down and go down, we will continue to open things up. It's, it's that simple. Let's remember the numbers will reflect how well we're doing and it's up to us to keep doing well. Thank you, and I will now uh, pass it over to uh, Mr. Schweitzer to uh, provide his update for the day. Thank you, uh, uh, Minister Shandro, and thank you to everyone participating here today uh, online and watching uh, and streaming this uh, press conference. Uh, we're making progress. Uh, and again, uh, to all the small business owners that have reached out to my ministry, elected officials uh, across Alberta, we want to tell you that uh, we've heard you, that we know how frustrating the last month has been, where many of you have had uncertain futures as to you know, what the next steps are going to be. Are the numbers going to come down? You've seen stories from around the world regarding uh, variants, uh, case increases. But I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the Albertans that have done the right thing over the last month, that have stayed apart, that have stayed home, uh, that have you know, been there with their kids, educating them at home. Uh, being there doing the right thing. So because of all of your efforts, we've actually been able to take some significant steps towards reopening uh, this past week with our schools being reopened. Uh, I'm seeing the, you know, the smiles on the kids' faces as they go into school, uh, that encouraging step there as they have that interactions again. And with that progress as well, we're seeing small businesses now with you know, personal services and wellness services now being able to reopen. And that is an encouraging step. Uh, and you know what? It's one of those things you, you, you want to be, you, you wish you could just open everything back up and that COVID could be behind us and that this could be yesterday, uh, but we're not quite there yet. We have to walk before we can run. Uh, this is the prudent step for us to do. It's the right step for us to do on this. And I think that if we continue, all of us together, to continue to act and do the right things, uh, further measures and further reopening can take place in the coming you know, weeks and months ahead. Uh, it's also encouraging to see the, uh, the vaccine progress that we're doing here with our health ministry. That is key to us, making sure we can get those vaccines distributed as fast as humanly possible into the most vulnerable. That is going to be critical for us as we move forward uh, and continue to reopen society. As Mr. Shandro has, has highlighted, there are certain variants that are out there that are far more transmissible. So we have to monitor this on a on a day by day basis, making sure we can keep our hospitalizations and the ICUs heading in the right direction. So again, thank you to all of our health officials. You're making this possible here. You're making it this all the ability to keep us healthy here in the province of Alberta. We also have a, an announcement to make here today. We've had so many businesses, and this kind of goes to the Alberta spirit. We've had so many businesses that have started up during this pandemic. It would be almost counterintuitive to so many of us that they would see an opportunity to grow a business and to hire people in the middle of a pandemic and start a business. Uh, but then again, so many of them have been impacted by recent health measures. So we are expanding the relaunch grant, small business uh, relaunch grant to include businesses that have started up during this pandemic uh, from March 1st of 2020 coming forward. They will now be eligible for up to $15,000 uh, of the relaunch grant. That is going to be the eligibility for that. Really the program will be available online in the first week of February. And to those small business entrepreneurs that started up in the middle of the pandemic, we want to thank you for being uh, just Albertan. Like that, nothing says uh, Alberta like a small business owner starting up in the middle of a pandemic. So we want to be there to support you. Uh, we know that these recent health measures have impacted your businesses. Uh, it'll be the same eligibility criteria for the relaunch grant that we had there pre-existing. So if you've had 30% revenue drop during this pandemic, you will be eligible for that relaunch grant now of up to $15,000. So again, to all the Albertans uh, out there, we thank you so much for what you've done, the sacrifices that you've made for the small business owners out there that are going to be able to open up again this next week. Uh, you know, good luck with it. Make sure you continue to follow the health protocols, uh, keeping everybody healthy that you service. So again, thank you for what you do to help make sure that we can keep Alberta you know, moving forward throughout this pandemic. And with that, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Hinshaw for her remarks. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. 
Before I share today's numbers, I want to note that we immunized more than 8,500 people yesterday, bringing the provincial total to almost 67,000. This is positive news. However, there are still available bookings for eligible health care workers this weekend. As of this morning, we had only 671 appointments on Saturday and 128 booked on Sunday. If you are an eligible health care worker who has not yet been immunized, please check your email and book your appointment as soon as possible. This will help protect your patients, your colleagues, and yourselves. Today, I also want to update you on a change in reporting terminology for cases of COVID-19 in schools. I know there are challenges with transitioning between online and in-person learning, and I want to recognize the efforts and flexibility of teachers and school staff, as well as students and families for making this happen. We've shown before that we have what it takes to keep students safe in school, and we can do that again. Our communication needs to be clear on this point. Over the fall, we received feedback from parents, education stakeholders and others that they had found the categories of alert, outbreak and watch confusing. Clear communication is key, especially when it comes to matters of public health. So we have listened to this feedback and updated our school outbreak terminology to make it clearer and easier to understand. Starting on Monday, this, the watch category will be removed from reporting of COVID-19 cases in schools. Instead, we will use categories with specific number ranges for schools with cases. An alert will apply to schools with one to four cases, and schools with two or more cases will still be included on our public reporting map as they have always been since September. In addition, there will be two categories of outbreaks one for schools with five to nine cases, and one for 10 or more cases. We have been asked to provide more detail on numbers of cases in outbreaks, and this change responds to this request. To be clear, this is a change to terminology only. It does not change the support that AHS is providing schools or the contact tracing and other work that is conducted. We hope this change makes it easier for staff, students and parents to understand the situation in their schools. We will continue to share timely information about cases in schools to help parents understand risk levels and keep the public informed while still protecting patient confidentiality. Turning to today's numbers, over the last 24 hours, we have identified 967 new cases of COVID-19 in the province and completed more than 16,000 new tests. That puts our current positivity rate at about 5.8%. There are currently 806 people in the hospital, including 136 admitted to the ICU. Sadly, 21 new deaths were reported to us in the last 24 hours. Every health zone in Alberta had at least one person included in these numbers. My deepest sympathies go out to anyone across the province who is mourning the loss of a loved one. In our schools, there are currently active alerts or outbreaks in 12 schools, or about 0.4% of schools in the province, with 15 cases in total. And to be clear, outbreaks uh, is using the old terminology, and again, the change will happen on Monday to the new terminology. Keeping our schools and communities safe is one of the reasons I want to again thank Albertans who continue to follow the health measures in place. Your choices and your sacrifices, both big and small, are reflected in the declining active case numbers that we are seeing. Although we've seen a small decline in case rates, and we are relaxing some measures, I want to stress the situation remains serious. Our numbers remain high and our health system is still under significant strain. Over the coming weeks, we must remain diligent in our efforts to bring these numbers down even further. By easing some measures, like outdoor gathering limits, we hope Albertans can have interactions that support mental health and limit isolation, while still continuing to limit in-person interactions whenever possible in other ways. You are making a difference. Please keep up the good work and keep making safe choices. Thank you, and we'll be happy to take questions.
All right, we'll go to the phone now. Please direct your question to either Minister Shandro, Minister Schweitzer, or Dr. Henshaw. Operator, could you put through the first caller, please? Third question is from, excuse me, first question is from Jeff Black with 660 News. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi there. I believe this question is for Minister Shandro. Um, it was announced today that Canada should start getting 2 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine delivered weekly in April. I know yesterday it was said that uh, supply shortages will be a common thing going forward until we start getting that consistency. Uh, but how likely is it that we may need to push back on phase two of the vaccine rollout if this is the case that we're not going to start getting that consistency until April? No, there's, there's not going to be a delay in, in phase two. Um, the, the difficulty is, is just making sure that we have as much vaccine as we have the capacity for in Alberta. And our commitment to Albertans is that we're going to get vaccines in their arms as quickly as we receive them. Um, once we get to, to phase two, actually, quite frankly, phase 1B, we are going to be including over 220,000 of our community seniors who are 75 and older. It's going to be really important for us to make sure that the federal government continues to ensure that we have a consistent supply to make sure that um, those appointments that are going to be made by those community seniors will be able to, to be fulfilled. Um, so as, as long as the federal government continues to do, um, make sure, quite frankly, that Health Canada has the resources that they need to get quicker approvals for more vaccines to come online in, uh, in the coming months and for them to press upon the manufacturers that are currently approved, Pfizer and Moderna, to uh, give a greater priority to Canada and we can continue to increase how much each of the provinces are getting. Remembering that um, well, Pfizer is coming weekly, Moderna right now is, is uh, once every three weeks. Um, Moderna is a fantastic vaccine for us to be getting to our remote and rural communities, but it's only 16,900 that we're going to be getting uh, every three weeks until the end of February when it increases to 24, 25,000. So uh, it's, 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 uh, we just need to press, as, as all the provinces do, we need to press upon the federal government to continue to give Health Canada the resources that it needs and for them to work with the manufacturers to give us greater priority. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Next is James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Hinshaw. What specific things do you want to see in the numbers, you know, R-value, infections, hospitalizations, to be comfortable with the idea of lifting the restrictions that were put in place in December? And what is the risk that even small changes like we're seeing today could either reverse the recent progress or just simply cause that decline to slow down or stall? What we need to see is continuing reductions in our hospitalizations and ICU uh, with respect to that target of decreasing the impact on the health system. That is absolutely essential. We need to see a reduction in our new case numbers and a reduction in our positivity rate as both of those two indicators help us understand what is coming with respect to people who will need hospital or ICU care. So again, those are our early indicators and the hospitalization ICU are uh, later or lagging indicators. When we have very high numbers, uh, it's important again to see our R value below one uh, as low as possible to indicate that we're dropping quickly with respect to our very high numbers going lower. And so those are the, the metrics that we're watching to make sure that we're monitoring the impact of both going back to school that happened earlier this week and then next week with the changes that were announced today because uh, ultimately uh, the, the changes need to be done in a very slow manner so that we can monitor them and how it impacts our overall case numbers is up to all of us. If we continue to follow those basic public health measures in all of our activities, including these new activities that have opened up, we can continue to have a downward trend at the same time as enjoying a few more activities in a safe way. Operator, Maybe if I can add to that, if that's okay. Sorry, Tom, I'm interrupting, but uh, James, just to, to drive the point home that this, uh, the most important uh, thing for us to be looking at is making sure that the stress, um, that we're not overstressing the, the healthcare system, that we have to continue to look at our hospitalizations and uh, our ICU admissions and uh, making sure that um, Albertans are getting the critical care that they need throughout the pandemic. Um, and that's, that's got to be our, our main focus. Uh, look, all of the restrictions are um, 
are, are measures that are placed on on different activities depending on 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 different levels of risk and so each of them we're going to have to look at those levels of risk um, obviously outdoor gatherings uh, have a different level of risk than indoor gatherings as an example and so depending on on the level of um, of icu emissions and hospitalizations as well as dr hinshaw said looking at uh, our values where they can be calculated calgary and, and edmonton and, and province-wide we can look at those those, um, those that data and, and those metrics to be able to make those decisions on the the different activities depending on the risk operator can you put through the next caller please next is lauren boothby with the edmonton journal go ahead lauren oh. hello this is for the health minister and for dr hinshaw um, so lifting the restrictions for personal services, is this a political decision or is it actually safe to do this? Uh, does this have anything to do with the petition with 16,000 signatures to reopen salons um, and those salons that have been publicly defying orders uh, by reopening? Um, there must have been a reason these services in particular were targeted for closure in December. So why were those services deemed risky then? Why aren't they deemed risky now? Um, this is a seems to be a big does not uh, reopen floating the rules or restrictions would have to stay longer. So what's changed in the last 24 hours? Uh, Dr. Incha? Sure. So uh, the points that I was making yesterday were with respect to businesses needing to follow the rules that are in place. And there still are rules in place for uh, those personal services even when they reopen on Monday. When we looked at all of the things that we had to close in December because our case counts were moving very quickly uh, to escalate uh, week over week and coming close behind was the hospitalization and ICU impact, which of course we've seen continue to escalate throughout the month of December. Uh, and so when we looked at all of the things that we had to close at that point in time in order to bring our numbers down, when we were considering what we might be able to reopen first, we did look at the evidence of transmission in the different settings that are currently closed or uh, have significant restrictions in place. And based on our own data, as well as the findings that have been published around the world with respect to what settings have the highest risk of transmission, where there's documented evidence of that risk, um, and categorizing all of those, we in Alberta, and this is consistent with other jurisdictions, um, and as I mentioned yesterday, we uh, have not seen significant transmission in those settings. In December, we did have to include them in the list in order to reduce the number of close contacts that Albertans had with each other on a daily basis. And as we were discussing the possibility of what things could be opened, the things that are being announced today were part of my recommendation based on the evidence, based on the levels of transmission that we have seen in different places. And our trend today is very different than our trend in December. Our trend in December was escalating quickly. And our trend today is uh, coming down in a reassuring way. This is not a, a guarantee of the future though. Of course, our future will depend on Albertans remaining responsible and those businesses that are currently opening, doing so following all of the public health measures. And so again, uh, the, the point being that the opportunity that we have today to begin starting to lift some of the limits is entirely dependent on all of us continuing to follow the measures in place in every setting. And, and just to supplement that, thank you, Dr. Inshaw, uh, just to supplement that, that, no, it's not political at all. As, um, as I said in response to James's question, that all of these activities that are affected by the, the measures, all of them have different levels of risk. And, um, and, and I use the example that outdoor social gatherings have a different level of risk than indoor social gatherings. And here we see, as Dr. Hinshaw pointed out, that uh, personal services have a, a different level of risk and, and one that with our case numbers, while well, we need to still press upon Albertans to, to continue doing what they're doing, to continue to limit the spread in their community and, and Albertans are doing a great job, um, our, our rate at this point is below one. We needed to continue to drop. That's really important for us. But as it is uh, below one, as our hospitalizations are starting to come down on a provincial wide level and uh, the ICU admissions as well, that um, that at this time that this is a level of risk 
that uh, with these this these metrics that is is one that um, that we can start to change. Now there are still restrictions, though. Remember that uh, at this time we still are doing personal services by appointment only, and folks have to still continue to follow the public health guidelines. Uh, during those those services, like wearing masks. So um, important for us to remember, there's still restrictions on personal services, but this time we can allow them to, to open for appointment only. All right, we've got time for three more questions. Operator, could you put through the next caller? Next is Rick Bell with the Calgary Sun. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, question for Minister Shandro. Uh, it's kind of a real quick three-part one, so I'll do it very quickly here. Uh, number one, You've explained sort of why you made the decision. What caused you to make the, the, these modest moves today? I think a lot of people were probably expecting nothing to happen today from the tone of perhaps some previous press conferences. So what caused you to make this modest move now? If things continue to go well, how close would we be to making other moves, for example, perhaps limited capacity opening of restaurants and coffee shops. Notice I didn't say bars. Uh, limited capacity restaurants and coffee shops. And what do you say to those people who will inevitably say, don't do it, keep her shut down. This is too risky. This is too perilous. So uh, what caused you to make the modest move now when a lot of people didn't think you'd do it? How close are we to things like limited capacity on restaurants and coffee shops and what do you say to the people who want to continue the lockdown? Well, thanks, Rick. Uh, so what, what caused us to uh, make a, a decision now regarding these, these low-risk activities is, quite frankly, because we, we told Albertans that we would um, have a review of, of these, uh, these measures, that we would give people um, a notice of, of one week. Um, so we're, we're, we uh, did a review. We looked at the data. We looked at the metrics. Um, on how uh, and, and to, to provide government with a, a mechanism for them to be able to um, make those decisions. So we, we developed those, those metrics for them to be able to, to make that informed decision. And we saw with our, our um, provincially, with our case numbers, with our hospitalizations, with our ICU admissions, that the, uh, the low risk activities were ones that, that could have their restrictions, still restrictions though, right, Rick? still restrictions on personal services, still restrictions on social gatherings outdoors. They're still limited to 10, still have to wear masks. Um, but uh, we can start to seeing easing uh, at this time, though with the, the, uh, the numbers, we can start to see easing in those areas, uh, as well as with uh, funeral services, still restrictions on, on receptions for funerals. But we can start to seeing with these numbers some easing. So that's that's what caused uh, the, the decisions today. Um, uh, how close are we? You, you asked about having limited capacity uh, for, for, I think the example you used was, uh, was restaurants and, and coffee shops. Um, look, this isn't a decision that we can um, uh, um, answer today for you, but it is something that we are committed to, to continuing to, to meet regularly with uh, Dr. Hinshaw and the, the ministry to, to continue to review the, the numbers. And um, our commitment as well is to those businesses is a couple things. So one is, I think they've told us loud and clear that um, especially for, for you to open and, and close for a restaurant, there's a lot of inventory that has to be purchased. There's a lot of notice that needs to be done. A lot of restaurants in particular have um, identified for us a concern that they don't want the yo-yoing of opening and closing and opening and closing. So we're um, listening to that feedback to those businesses. We're also committed then second as well to ensuring that we give people notice um, before that we make uh, any changes on the restrictions to restaurants and, and coffee shops. Um, what do we say to people who are, are critical of this is, look, this is us continuing to do what we've always promised throughout the pandemic, which is to, to look at the data and to make decisions that are targeted that are minimizing uh, business disruptions. And uh, that's exactly what we've done today, what we've done throughout the pandemic, and what we're going to continue to do going forward. Thanks, Rick. Operator, could you put through our second last question, please? This is Julia Wong with Global News. Go ahead, Julia. 
Hi, this question is for Dr. Hinshaw, but if the health minister wants to chime in, that'd be great. Um, you were saying earlier you want to see a continuing reduction when it comes to hospitalizations, ICUs, the positivity rate. Uh, you mentioned R value and reduction of new cases so that more restrictions can be eased. But what specifically are the benchmarks for each of those metrics? We're, uh, again, looking at a, a stepwise approach. So looking at the specific measures that we currently have in place and the activities associated with them. And, and again, the things that we have seen are linked to uh, higher numbers of cases and new cases are things that do need to wait a little bit longer. So uh, with respect to the, the specific benchmarks, again, we're looking at a stepwise approach down uh, and down again as we, as we look at the kinds of things that we might be able to ease in the future. Uh, but this first move is a test case. So this is our uh, opportunity to give Albertans a, a little bit more um, freedom and, and the ability to do a few more activities uh, in a safe way. And we are going to be able to then consider going forward whether or not we can ease a few more measures if despite these decisions and actions today, we continue to see that downward trend in our hospitalization, ICU admissions, cases and positivity. So again, this it really is up to all of us to be able to meet those stepwise levels going down to be able to open additional things going forward. And, and Tom, just to, to add to that, just to use this as an opportunity, uh, Julie, just because you asked about hospitalizations and ICU admissions, just to use this as an opportunity to, to say that um, as, as we look at our hospitalizations, obviously it's, it's going to um, also involve our, our, our workplace capacity. We have many of our healthcare workers who are getting immunized right now who are eligible for vaccinations in, uh, in phase one. Uh, just to point out to anybody who's listening that uh, right now there are 16,000 uh, appointments that are available through AHS on both, um, uh, well, um, 16,000 in total for Saturday and Sunday. And so uh, for anybody who is eligible uh, for you to make sure that uh, you're, you're, you're um, booking your appointment uh, for this weekend, we have a lot of eligibility or a lot of open spots right now through those 16,000 available appointments where you can, as a healthcare worker, through AHS, make sure you get your vaccination this weekend. And uh, thank you to all of our amazing healthcare workers who are stepping up to, uh, to take care of Albertans. It's because of their commitment to Albertans that we're making sure we're there for them and getting their vaccine. So thank you. Operator, could you put through the final question, please? Final question is Aaron Collins with CBC National. Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, hey there. This is, uh, I guess, for Dr. Hinshaw and uh, Minister Shandro. Uh, you mentioned the, those two new variants that we've found here, and I just wanted to get a sense of how exactly you're monitoring that those new variants. Uh, are they coming up in the testing you're doing, and do we have a sense of how many people have tested positive for them? Is there getting back to, I guess, the benchmarks and I didn't actually get the answer there. It sounded to me like there aren't specific benchmarks to the previous question, but is there a number of positive cases for that UK variant that you need to see before starting to act? The main concern with the variant is if it becomes established and begins to spread in the community and all cases that we have identified with either the uh, either of those two variants of concern that have been identified globally. All of the cases we have to date in Alberta have been related to travel and in one case, a uh, very small number of household contacts who um, did get the virus from that person who had traveled, but there was no onward spread in the community. And so at the moment, uh, what we're doing is we're monitoring all of our samples that test positive, a proportion of those, go for additional testing and I mentioned earlier this week there's two kinds of testing we do to monitor for any kinds of genetic variations. The one kind of testing is a fairly lengthy process, takes some time and it's genetically sequencing the entire virus so that not only would help us identify any of these variants of concern, it would also help us identify if there were any additional changes that we're seeing 
uh, come to pass in some of the virus that is in Alberta. And so that's been done um, since the beginning of the pandemic. We've been doing a certain proportion of our samples, a certain number of our samples every week. And we are moving to increase that number of weekly tests with the full genetic uh, sequencing. In addition to that, there is a shorter test, a quicker test that we're able to do that we're currently working to scale up. And we are planning by the end of this month to be able to test 100 positive samples every day in a targeted way that would help us identify whether or not a uh, variant of concern was present. And so this test would uh, identify either of those two variants of concern. So we're doing both of those types of tests and want to make sure that we're monitoring for the potential presence of those variants in the community. To date, we have not identified any cases except those that have uh, recently traveled or again in that one particular case, some household contacts with no further community spread. Thank you, and, and Tom, uh, as well, just uh, to supplement Aaron's, uh, for Aaron's question, um, and uh, of course, of course, folks are aware of the uh, the, the border pilot project uh, here in Alberta at the Calgary International Airport, as well as the the land border crossing at Coots. And for those who sign up for that that um, that border pilot project, if they do sign up, there's a test as they arrive into uh, into Alberta. Uh, at either of those two locations and then a further second test uh, between day six and day seven. And so 100% of the folks who test positive through the, the border pilot project um, are having their samples sequenced uh, through the UFC. So thank you to the amazing folks uh, at uh, the UFC for, for helping us assist in that uh, sequencing project and to, to Dr. Hinshaw's office for, um, for making sure that's getting done. Thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Anshaw will provide another update on Monday afternoon. Have a safe night. Thank you, Tom.